Welcome to the British Library and the Festival of the Accused. I'm Brett Walsh from the Cultural Events Department. I'm delighted to introduce uh, this event. So um, before I hand over to our chair, Rebecca, just a few points of housekeeping. We will be taking questions towards the end of the event. So if you're in the audience, please do wait for the microphone. And if you're watching us online, uh, you can submit the question in the um, form below the video. Um, also, I'd like to welcome the Living Knowledge Network, viewers from um, around the UK who are watching in their local libraries. So welcome to you as well. Um, so our chair tonight is Rebecca Radil. She is a historian of early modern England and the director of the history festival, Histfest. She is uh, author of 1666, Plague, War and Hellfire, and she hosts the history podcast, Killing Time. Uh, in 2024, she'll be tutoring that old crafty serpent, magic and witchcraft in the 17th century at Oxford University's School for Continuing Education. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Rebecca and the panel. Thank you. Thanks, Brett. Um, and hello, everyone. Have you had a nice day so far? Yes. <laughs> I actually had a response as well. That's amazing. That's great. Good, good. Well, it's about to get even better. <laughs> Um, we have a really large panel tonight, so we're going to try and get through as much as we possibly can, but there will be space to ask questions towards the end if I haven't managed to cover anything that you thought would be covered or you wanted covered. Um, just to give you a very brief introduction to our speakers, um, we have A.K. Blakemore, who's a poet, novelist, and the author of two full-length collections of poetry. Her de debut novel, The Manning, Manning Tree Witches, was released in 2021 to critical acclaim. And next we have Juno Dawson, who's a novelist, screenwriter, journalist, and columnist for Attitude magazine. Her books include the bestsellers This Book is Gay and Clean and Meat Market as well. She's also the author of the adult fantasy trilogy Her Majesty's Royal Coven, which was launched in 2022. Next, we have Kirsty Logan, who's a writer of novels and short stories, including Things We Say in the Dark, A Portable Shelter, and The Rental Heart and Other Fairy Tales. Her latest book is Now She's a Witch. And last but not least is Stacey Thomas, who's a contributor to Bad Form and an alumna of, of the Curtis Brown Creative Novel Writing Course. Her debut novel, The Revels, was released this year. Um, now, you don't really want to hear that much from me today. So I mean, I'm gonna hand over to our authors and ask them if they don't mind to take us into the world of their novels and just describe what they're about without giving away the ending because we do want people to buy the books at the end. <laughs> that's, that's the aim of today. Um, and I can't remember how I've ordered the slides. So I'm not sure who will come up first. So, <laughs> so it's kind of, a, let's see. No, oh. that's the end. That's, <laughs> that's, that's not correct. Here we hey, go. Kirsty. Now she's Kirsty. <laughs> um, hello, hi. Um, my name's Kirsty Logan. Uh, my oh, that's not my book. Oh my god. Oh, oh no. Do you want to go? Are you sure? Yeah. What happened? What happened? I'm happy for you. Yeah. Oh, I think you might. This just, is like, fun. Skip by <laughs> I don't want to cut you. You know when I said it was about to get better. <laughs> <laughs> no, Let's just do this. Okay. This is brilliant. Oh, we can see it down there. Oh, we can see it down there. Yeah. Turn around. Oh yeah. No. Okay. Okay. Stacey. Okay. Probably okay. some professionals. I'm yeah. finished at Stacey. Okay. And if it's a tech person, terrible. that would be great. So, hi everyone. So, my name's Stacey Thomas, and my debut The Revels is set during the English Civil War. It follows a young man, Nicholas Pierce, who's apprenticed to an infamous former witch hunter. The only problem is that Nicholas is a witch himself who's hiding a dark secret that the dead sing to him. So, my story is all about him trying to survive while getting drawn into a gruesome witch hunt. And if that wasn't complicated enough, finding love for the first time. <laughs> no, it's, it's, a, it's a brilliant novel. And I should have said before I handed over, actually, that um, a, a critic has described it as follows. A darkly fascinating, spellbinding novel that captivates with its fresh perspective and twists. And we'll come on to talking a little bit more about your novel shortly. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. If this works, yes, oh. it works. <laughs> OK, Amy. <laughs> Before you, before you go, though, I am going to remind you of an, a lovely quote from a critic about Please your do. book as well. <laughs> and it has been called, not just the best debut novel I've read in years, the best historical novel I've read since Wolf Hall. Um, it's also the winner of the Desmond Elliott Prize in 2021 and was shortlisted for the Costa Prize as well. 
Me. <laughs> um, <laughs> hi, I'm A.K. Blakemore. My debut novel, The Manning Tree Witches, um, is about the witch craze in Essex in the 1640s, so also the English Civil War period, um, and specifically in the towns of Manning Tree and Mistley, which is where the witch finder general Matthew Hopkins began his career. And it focuses on Rebecca West um, and her mother, Anne, uh, who were two real women uh, who were accused of witchcraft in Manning Tree. Thank you, thank you. And next we have Kirsty Logans, <laughs> now she is a witch. Um, this has been described by a critic as mesmerising and evocative, an imaginative triumph. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you, critic. <laughs> yeah, so um, now she is witch uh, is my uh, eighth book, my third novel. Um, and the short version of what it's about is that it's a queer medieval witch revenge quest. Um, the slightly longer version is that it, we, we meet the protagonist, Lux, at the beginning of the book, and she has been ejected from a sanctuary, a kind of home for wayward girls, where she was sent and uh, kicked out a few years later. And she has arrived home. Um, her mother has been killed as a witch, and she arrives back to this decrepit house where she grew up in the woods, where she and her mother sold poppets and poisons and curses to um, try and have some power in this world where they have nothing. Um, and then there's a stranger at the door who's this mysterious figure called Else who wears a hood and has strange scarring, strange kind of pock marks around her mouth. And Else wants Lux to go on a revenge quest with her to take revenge against the, the man who sends the witches to burn. And she doesn't really want to do this, but she doesn't really have a lot of choices. She can either try and make the same life that her mother raised her to have, um, but of course we all know how her mother ended up, and um, her other choice is to, to go on this journey. Uh, so she does. And that's just the very beginning. Um, we go through various adventures that she has and she uh, makes her way to the frozen north where she believes the witches come from. Uh, and I won't tell you what she finds there. <laughs> <laughs> and next, last but not least, again, we have Juno Dawson, whose um, HMRC novel, not that one, <laughs> <laughs> has been described as vibrant and meticulous, sorry, a vibrant and meticulous take on witchcraft and Juno's characteristic wit and grit shine through. Over to you. Um, yeah, um, Her Majesty's Royal Coven, that was deliberate. HMRC <laughs> is deliberate. Um, it's about um, five women in their thirties who've been friends since they were little girls. Um, they also happen to be very powerful witches, some of whom still work for the government agency of witches, so it's set now, so I'm the only contemporary one on the panel. Um, and they, there is a government department of witches, they are doing, keeping the United Kingdom safe from supernormal threat, and um, um, it's about what happens when a prophecy arises concerning a young transgender witch, and their friendship is sorely tested, as they have very different opinions about how they should respond to the arrival of a young trans witch. <laughs> Topical. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're all they're all absolutely brilliant novels, and I highly recommend. Um, along with all the critics as well, obviously. <laughs> um, I was just interested to first start start off this conversation with a look at witch fiction and witches in fiction. And before we started this a few a couple of weeks ago, I asked our panelists if they could suggest or or name the fictional witch that has had the most impact on them. One of one selection was chosen by two people. So I gave them a chance to have another go as well and they've chosen an extra. So it's a bit it's a bit skewed. We do have two panelists that get two goes, but apologies. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, again, I'm not too sure what order, but I do have a suspicion. This is so exciting. I, yeah, know. I, know. I think the most exciting <laughs> panel I've ever been on. <laughs> who knows so, who what knows? will happen? Here we go. Hey. <laughs> we'll, who would that like was to ours. speak on? <laughs> do you want to go first? Willa, what, what can I say? I, I, I love her. I love the, the journey she goes on from sort of put upon, cripplingly shy best friend to rising witch to dark phoenix style big bad to repentant blonde and as well really one of, one of very few queer people that I could see on telly when I was growing up and it, it didn't feel 
I was about to say, she doesn't get punished for being queer, but they literally kill yeah, her kill girlfriend. Yeah, kill her girlfriend. <laughs> but, but it felt like she, did, she didn't hand ring her. And so, so the only mm. other reference I had was Jack from Dawson's Creek, who, who wrote tortured poetry about it and seemed to really hate himself. Yeah. Whereas Willa kind of, she was a witch and she was bisexual and that was fine. I suppose to add to that, when I was thinking about Willow and why she was more culturally significant, like beyond the kind of associations of witchcraft with alternative sexualities, which is now quite entrenched and didn't perhaps begin with Willow, but was cemented with Willow in kind of the popular imagination. I think it's also important to remember that when Buffy was first airing was basically when, certainly in America, we were moving out of the satanic panic and the association of the occult with, with Satanism. And I think kind of Willow in terms of kind of being this white witch and being this kind of benevolent power, certainly in the beginning, was sort of instrumental to this idea of witchcraft as a more friendly and approachable thing, <laughs> perhaps. Yeah. yeah, no, I think that's really mm. interesting. Um, I will give both of you another chance to <laughs> talk about your favourites as well. Mm. Just because they were so good, I couldn't not put them on the slide. Mm. So the next, the next one that we have is... Oh. <laughs> so this, this is this was my pick and I did think so I went to Willa first but then actually by the time we realized that Amy and I had come up with the same one I was like well that's not strictly true because perhaps I wouldn't have been so into <coughs> anything slightly occult or supernatural had it not been for Jill Murphy's worst witch mm. books which I think I read when I was five or six years old and I think with a bit of hindsight that was the first time I'd seen a witch presented positively. Mm. You know, the witch was something to be feared or scared of. You know, the other her contemporary was Grotbags, who is also <laughs> slay in her own way. But, um, but you know, Mildred was the goody and she was mm. witch. And there were lots of, you know, within Hardbrew, with, within the Hubble Academy, there was good witches like Maud and Mildred. And there were bad witches like Edith and Miss Hardbroom was basically Professor Snape. Before, <laughs> before Professor Snape, and we'll just leave it at that. But, um, but um, yeah, I, I think possibly I wouldn't have been as ready for Buffy had it not been mm. for the introduction that The Worst Witch gave me. Okay, okay, I loved it as well. And I had to put that photograph, because for me, that's, that's Mildred. But <laughs> anyway, next we have... This is mine. Um, so, yeah, this is a weirdly personal one. So I grew up in South East London, Deptford, uh, just around the corner from the church where Christopher Marlowe the early modern playwright was buried. And um, like any self-respecting teenage goth, I was much more of a Marlowe girly than a Shakespeare girly. Um, <laughs> I wrote my thesis on Marlowe at university and um, Dr. Faustus is my favorite Christopher Marlowe play. And we don't often think of Faustus as a witch because he's never explicitly presented as one and because he's a man. But what he does is sell his soul to the devil uh, for unlimited supernatural power. He has um, a familiar in the shape of Mephistopheles and it's, it's a classic kind of um, early modern play of kind of intellectual overreach. But um, you can kind of think of it as like early modern witch lit, it's in a way. Um, and I suppose one of the things I've always found fascinating about it is how clearly Marlowe sort of cheekily admires <laughs> Faustus. Um, he's just this very potent and powerful character who had, I mean, huge cultural impact because, in you know, he's sort of the template for Frankenstein and, and sort of all these intellectual overreaches of um, later literature. So, yeah, Dr. Faustus. I think that's a really <laughs> good one. And you can't, you can't get away from Faustus on stage. He's, no. he's always there, mm. always. Um, <laughs> and next we will go to Nancy Downs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey. So Nancy's mine. Um, <laughs> If you can't guess, I was very much a teenage goth. Um, <laughs> and growing up, yeah, in the kind of late 80s, early 90s, I was definitely surrounded by quite positive depictions of witches. Um, a lot of even the picture books I had had witches in them, Megan Mogg, um, which I now read with my two-year-old. Um, it's very popular in our house, the, the Megan Mogg book. Um, and there was also Winnie the Witch. So there were lots of... Um, Po quite very positive um, mm. depictions of witches. They definitely weren't presented to me as um, sort of evil or negative in any way. Um, and then obviously kind of mid 
mid 90s um yeah like witch chic was very much a thing i remember mm. looking in the bookshops at all the the spell books that had the purple velvet covers extremely mm. desirable you could get the little bags of crystals like loved all of that stuff and a lot of them were i think very um wholesome spells um it wasn't about kind of causing harm to anyone or anything um it was very much about you know you take your crystal out into the garden in the morning sun and the, you collect up the dew and wash your face with it and then it will give you this beautiful outlook on life um, and it, it was lovely I really um, I loved all that stuff and I loved the craft I don't like the ending of the craft no um, I, in my sells head, out her no. sisters bitch. in my head it, <laughs> in my head it ends mm -hmm. differently I've just like retconned it in my head which is fine I reserve the right to, to do that if I choose to. Um, but I just love that. And I suppose uh, any craft fans in here, you know, Sarah is, I suppose, the real witch. She's the one that has the real powers. But Nancy was the one that I found so fascinating because of the depth of her emotions. Um, and I think we're meant to connect with Sarah because she's, you know, the main character. She has this trauma of having lost her mother. She has this difficult situation with her losery boyfriend. Um, and I just didn't. I just really connected with Nancy. And her life was absolutely nothing like mine. Um, but I just felt like she felt so intensely, which is how I felt as a teenager. I think I don't know if I will ever feel emotion as intensely as I did as a teenager. Um, and to me, that there was that connection with, with witchcraft is it allowed you to to feel and I think teenage girls emotions and feelings continue to be scorned and seen as not important um, mm. but the craft showed me that actually my feelings were important and they did matter <laughs> and also she just looks really cool she's she? just yeah. so cool <laughs> she's also yeah. badass yeah. I, I bought black lipstick specifically because of Nancy <laughs> sadly I did not look like that wearing but we can hope but you also mentioned you also mentioned if this was about historical cases that you're interested in the pendle which mm. which trials or um there was i don't know how many of them there were now there's around 20 19 20. yeah shall um I, but shall yeah I a little bit? so i'm no historian i will say i'm definitely a novelist so i'm interested in history insofar as it allows me to tell a story so any historical inaccuracies are my mistake alone um but what yeah this is why i decided to write a witch novel i got very interested in the story of the pendle witches um which was essentially um two blended families we might say these two kind of matriarchs um and all of their illegitimate children lived in this place called malkin tower this kind of abandoned tower just outside <coughs> the town and they made their living such as it was by either selling services or placing curses on the people of the town so if they were hungry they would say i will give you this charm and if the people said no they were like well in that case i'm going to put the evil eye on you i'm going to put a curse okay. on you and of course we'll never know whether they whether anyone believed that they really had that kind of power um but i found it really fascinating that they weren't nice they weren't nice. And I was really, really interested in this idea of a perfect victim, which seemed very timely, to, timeless and timely to me, that these conversations keep coming up again and again, mostly to do with women, but not just women, all different types of marginalized people, of they are not doing victimhood correctly, or they're not nice enough, or they should be more grateful, or they should, they should do this, they should do that. They sold each other out as well. That's well, why that I find too, fascinating. Yeah. They really did. They threw each other under the yep. bus, the, the 16th century bus. And there, there are lots of, yeah, lots of stories like that. Yeah, well, the horse and cart. They, <laughs> they threw, threw, each threw each other under, under the, the, the cart. Um, yeah, there were lots of stories of uh, mothers denouncing uh, their children, children denouncing their mothers, sisters denouncing each other, brothers and sisters, everything. And you think, well, how could that have happened? And it's easy to see how that happens. That type of thing happens even now. Um, but I was very interested in that. And I think Nancy interests me as well because she's certainly not a perfect victim either. Um, and I think that question remains of why does somebody only deserve our sympathy and our care if they act in a certain way that we think is acceptable? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we'll move on to, I'm not very familiar with this person yeah. at all. Susie Banyu, can you tell us more, Stacey? Yeah, so basically this is the 2018 remake of the film Suspiria. And like, I really like this. So it's kind of like, it's not like a true remake in that it kind of, if anyone's seen like the 1977 version, it's kind of like a different kind of like animal. But I feel like with Susie Bannon, I quite liked her and I guess 
she's probably the witch who's had the most influence on me because in the film she comes from this really kind of conservative religious background and like again we don't really see a lot of it but what we do see is that you know she's punished for kind of going after the things she wants or like trying to pursue her own pleasures and so early in the film she runs away to Germany to kind of dance um, to join this kind of dance company which is actually like a coven of witches and like when we realized that my first thought was like oh my god she's in so much trouble because on the surface she's kind of like in a way the perfect victim because she's just kind of this seemingly kind of wide-eyed kind of good girl and then you actually realize later on that you know she's a lot more complicated she's actually the mother of witches and I feel with her it's kind of like I love the kind of layers to her story the idea that it's like you know she, she can be one thing and then later on it's like she's someone completely different she's someone to be feared she's not good she's not evil she's this delicious combination of both and so when I was writing my novel like it really kind of made me it kind of inspired me to make my characters really quite layered as well and just be quite fearless about it and the film has Tilda Swinton so it's worth watching for that alone as well <laughs> Tilda Swinton playing every part yeah, as well yeah, that's the amazing yeah. The, for, for real, she plays about three parts. Yeah, wow. yeah. Mm. It's a really like beautiful film as well. So yeah, just... she is an, the the ultimate witch actually. Tilda Swinton. Yeah. She played um, the white the, the white the white witch, didn't she? In Narnia yes, as well. yes. I remember. Yeah, I remember seeing that. Yeah, yeah. She's been in everything. God. Yeah. So on on that note, these your I think your example is probably the most recent, um, albeit an an adaptation or an update. Do, are we actually experiencing a boom in witch lit, Stacey? So I would say yes and no, because like with my book, and it's set in like the um, 17th century, but then even then you had Thomas Potts who wrote his account of the Pendle witch trials, and then you also had witch pamphlets that were very popular. So I feel like no matter what the century, people have grown up with these supernatural tales. So I feel like there's always kind of been a boom, but like, I feel like when there's kind of like, it's quite concentrated then people are like, oh my God, this is like a new trend. And actually it's always been there because even when I think back to my childhood, like there are so many witch stories that I grew up in. So I feel like with a lot of people, it's kind of part of their kind of cultural mm. legacy in a way. Does anyone else have any other thoughts on that? Yeah. yeah I, oh, no, sorry. Uh, okay. Um, I think, I mean, witches are, are really, really potent figures because it's quite difficult to find female figures in history who feel both subversive and powerful. Mm. And the witch is kind of the, the obvious feminine archetype that, that contains all of that. Um, I would say in terms of contemporary publishing, unfortunately, I think kind of the current sort of like, I, I think publishing is very, very trend driven and very risk averse. And it tends to be that when something starts doing very well, we see lots and lots and lots more of it. So kind of, I think with the current wave, I think it's more to do with that than any sort of resurgence of, of intellectual interest in witches, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think sort of attempts to, to read much deeper into it <laughs> end up turning much up, yeah. It is interesting though, isn't it, when, I mean, it's a very subjective. Um, it's very subjective whether a time is a time of turmoil or not, because it depends on who you are, where you live, and what you're going through. Mm. But it's interesting when it appears that we are living through times that are especially hard. I mean, we have austerity, we have the um, cost of living crisis here. That people do tend to turn to fantasy, to witches. Would you say that's true? Well, I think witches, in terms of yeah, in terms of a trend, I think like vampires, witches are never really going to go out of fashion in terms of storytelling. So, for example, you know, all of our books came out at around the same time, but none of our books were influenced by each other's because mm. that would be impossible because there's a very long process to write a book. I mean, mine took six years and I'm sure the others took, took many years as well. So none of us knew, obviously, that each other was writing about witches. So by the time the books came out, there was this boom of, of witch lit. Um, but that's just because we're all kind of swimming in the same cultural waters. Nobody mm. was particularly influenced by anybody else. It's just we all grew up, you know, watching The Worst Witch and watching The Craft. And um, so we all, of course, have these, these thoughts in our minds. We all have seen certain um, strange-haired American politicians tweeting about witch hunts. <laughs> um, so we, we all want to think, no, that's not right. 
I'm going to do it my way. Mm. Um, I'm going to bring in this different way of looking at it. So I think we all do that. But I think personally, the reason that witches and vampires come in and out of fashion but will never really go away is that they're both linked to sex and danger which we love, um, and we always have loved, and we always will love, um, because there's always been this linking of witchcraft and unbridled or uncontrolled sexuality. So a lot of people accused of witchcraft were um, young unmarried women or older widowed women who were beyond childbearing age. So what? What use were they? What good were they if they couldn't be married and have a baby? Um, and also queer people. And of course, that's difficult to study too much because the language that we have now is not the language that would have existed then. So I certainly struggle to find too much um, to do with it. Um, you have to kind of dig through the, the layers of how things were phrased. Um, but anyone whose sexuality did not conform to this very heteronormative patriarchal structure was viewed with suspicion because they weren't they weren't fitting into the the correct box. Um, so there was this danger. There was this link to sex, and similarly with with vampires. So I think that's why we're going to keep mm. coming back to it because because even the kind of more. Um, depictions of witches that perhaps weren't meant to be viewed sexually, they're often naked. Um, they're often, you have these kind of very voluptuous bodies. You know, we've all seen the, the etchings of the, the kind of voluptuous witches naked, falling off the broomsticks, flying through the sky, all women together. It's very suspicious when women all get together. <laughs> what are they doing? They've got broomsticks, what are they up to? Um, and I won't get into all the, the phallic implications of broomsticks, of course. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, there's, there's kind of all this stuff about sexuality. So I think that's why they just are going to keep coming back and back and back. I think the only thing that changes is what do we need the witch to be? Mm. You know, the, the witch is, and I think the vampire as well. And so in some regards, the ghost as well. Like what, what do we as a society need them to be? Do we need them to be an allegory for queerness? Do we need them to represent some sort of misfit or outsider or loner? Mm. Or... And I think there is something about the timing of our novels around Me Too. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the publishing industry, I love it, and it has put a roof over my head. But, <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's not always wildly imaginative, because they would be writing books if they could. And, um, and, and then so I think there was, around 2017, with Weinstein and Bill Cosby and the rest, Trump in particular, I think there was a sense of... You know how do we do how do we do novels about this? You know it felt like truly there was some sort of sort of uprising, you know, in, around that time, and and I think right now that that's what we needed the witch to be. We needed mm. the witch to be the woman who wouldn't take it anymore, and so I wonder if that's why. And now it will. Say, I think I just don't want to say fail, but now we'll you know we'll come down the other side. And I'm already seeing a lot of hunger in the industry for vampires. It's time for the vampire to make a comeback, I mm -hmm. think. And that's because there has been in the last two, three years, there have been a lot of witch books. I, what I love is that no two are the same. And I think that's, mm. that's because we all needed the witch to be slightly different mm. things as well. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it does feel like witches are able, they're, they're given permission to change and evolve and be different, whereas vampires always seem to be the same. They're always brooding, aren't they? We're still, I think we're still stuck in that Byronic model of a vampire, aren't we? They're always brooding <laughs> and, then, the and then eating. That's, that's all they do. And anyway, that's an aside. This isn't about vampires, it's about witches. <laughs> that's next year. I think, I think, this time next year, we'll be back. No, I agree. And I think what's going to come next is the Eat the Rich um, Anti-capitalist. Oh, we're already there. I Are think. we there? Okay. Uh, cannibalism think, is yeah. this year. That, yeah, that's yeah. true. So hot right because now. of course we had. <laughs> and I'm right in there. Okay. Because yeah, yeah. 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 we had the, obviously the vampire connected to the AIDS crisis, the AIDS epidemic, mm. um, and I think like the witch, the vampire is going to mean different things at different times. But yeah, I think that's that's going to be. A big thing. Interesting historical anecdote, actually. Interest in Elizabeth Bathory. I don't know if people are familiar oh, yeah. with her story. Oh, yeah. her. Grew in England in the early 18th century as soon as the word vampire entered the English lingo. So, mm -hmm. that link there. Anyway, that's a little anecdote. And um, what do we think then of the witch? And we've touched on it a little bit here already, but the witch is a figure of resistance. Oh God, it's spotlights <laughs> on me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, to me, like, I always saw, like, when I think about the witch in general terms, like, I always saw her as, like, this kind of outsider kind of figure in a way, just someone who's kind of, you know, rejected, whether it's by her family or whether it's by, you know, society. And even just with the film, The Witch, 
as well um, with Anya. I can never remember her last name. Taylor Anya, Joy. Yeah, Taylor Anya Joy. Taylor Joy. Which, when you just think about that, in a way, she does kind of resist because it's sort of that thing. It's like she has a really kind of tense relationship with her mother. And it's like, you know, her desires for luxury, they kind of like it's dismissed. And then at the end, it's like she gets everything she wants, even though she has to sell her soul to the devil for it. But I feel like with the witch, it's just this idea that it's a figure that you can embrace if you don't want to conform, like if you want something different that people are telling you not to have. Mm. So it's, mm. it's quite liberating in a way when you think about it. Yeah. I think we do need to be careful though, in terms of kind of the conflation of the, f the figure of the witch with kind of um, Wiccan practice and, and the idea of the witch as a figure of power when historically, as has already been touched on, most of the, the women and indeed men who were accused of being witches tended to be people who were in some way disempowered yeah. um, economically, or they were lacking male protection, they were what we would now understand as disabled, for instance, or queer. Um, and I think there, I think that there's kind of been a bit of a, it, it can be a way of sort of depoliticizing or ignoring the politics that surrounded the figure of the witch historically. Um, like it, it was interesting that some of the kind of um, things that people have said to me after events about my, my novel, The Manning Tree, which is just like, oh, I didn't like how passive the characters were. And it, it's based in historical facts. And it's kind of, well, you know, I, I wasn't, you know, these women were genuinely executed. I wasn't going to have them stage a cunning escape, you know, the, the historical. Um, yeah, and I, and I think, yeah, this, this almost expectation that if you're depicting a witch, it's sort of like the perfect victim thing again. She needs to be this kind of spunky... Mm. The yassification. Modern, yeah. yeah, the yassification <laughs> of the witch, historically. That's a good way of putting it. Um, and I think we do need to hold on to kind of the historical reality of what it meant to be, 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 you know, it didn't necessarily mean you were kind of um, a girl boss. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like the, the witch boss, as girl witch. boss yeah. Um, yeah. has its place, but I think we need to hold on to the fact that it, it wasn't. I think, yeah, yeah fo following on from what you're saying, mm. Amy, I <laughs> completely agree that mm. the situation is more complicated than, because uh, we like things to be binary, right? We yeah. like things to be simple and mm. they're not, the world is not like that. And I think it's also really important um, to remember that there was a lot of overlap between the accused and the accusers. Um, mm. Often people who were accused could get the heat off them, so to speak, by accusing somebody else. That's yeah. why there were so many accusations bandied about. Um, and actually in Now She's Witch, I do talk about that, about how sometimes, so for example, again, this is my understanding of the history, apologies if this is um, actually not correct, but as I understand it, um, at the time of a lot of the witch trials, um, women and children were not allowed to give evidence in court mm. unless it was a witch trial. Yeah. So the only time that a woman could speak and be heard in court and her words be recorded through for history was if it was a witch trial. Mm. And I can understand how someone who has no power, no voice, can't read, can't write, nobody's listening, that's appealing. That's when someone's finally going to listen to you. Um, so I think there's that. And I'm extremely troubled by the phrase, we are the daughters of the witches. Yes, I hate that. I don't love it. <laughs> well, Sorry if any of you were well, wearing a t-shirt. don't love it. Because the unfortunate thing that we don't like to think about is the likelihood is we're not the daughters of the witches. We're the daughters and sons and non-binary children of the people the doing, the, yeah. doing the accusations or just doing nothing. The people mm. who were thinking... I'm so glad they're accusing that person over there and not me. And that's the unfortunate and uncomfortable truth that I think we do need to face, that if we were living in those times, would we be the ones defending the accused witch? Probably not. And that's understandable also, because the world is not split into the perfect, good, innocent people quietly doing their knitting, petting little rabbits, and the evil, evil people with the burning torches. That's not how the world is. The world is a lot more complicated than that. So I think... Maybe that's why we keep circling back to the witch because it does complicate these binaries. And as much as we might like to think we want a simple world, I don't think we do really. Mm -hmm. I think we understand that the world is complicated. And certainly not simple stories because no. that's perhaps, you know, how much does Royal Coven is my first foray into adult fiction properly. And while actually I think some of my YA novels are actually much darker, like Clean and Meat Market are quite thorny. But, um, that's the nice thing about having a trilogy, which is I can paint a really broad picture that has 
really complicated things and the whole thing is all three novels are about what is what is a woman to do within a patriarchy even if you are a woman with otherworldly powers mm. and obviously very quickly after I started writing the book I was like oh, wait the true villain is the coven it's like in <laughs> Devil Wears Prada the true villain is her boyfriend um, <laughs> and um and so I started, I started realizing that these these women have these incredibly powerful women have volunteered to serve the patriarchy mm. through a government coven mm. and and how bonkers that is kind of and then b before I knew it there was a much bigger story and I, and I think that's what makes it fun to think about the witch is that she is she while she can be a figure of resistance there's often more to it than that and, and mm. I don't think any of our novels would be very interesting if that's all she was yeah. Yeah. but I do think and I know that obviously Naomi Alderman and I, I think we're having the same same thing about what what if you know what if what if women could tap into some unforeseen power that could take on the patriarchy but it's very hard not to think of it as and part of maybe what makes it so delicious is that we are disempowered we all wish we were able to control the weather because we can't I can't kill men willy-nilly the way my characters do I've tried and it's <laughs> shh, shh, don't tell anyone <laughs> yeah, okay, this is being recorded for legal reasons I have never killed a man allegedly <laughs> But it's also that word as well, the word witch. I think, um, I think it's in your book, Kirsty. You have, boy, and this isn't giving anything away, but you have, well, maybe it is, actually. I'll, I'll, hopefully it's not giving too much away. But there's a, a point where the main character is being accused of something and there's people outside saying, witch, bitch, witch, bitch. Mm. And I think if you were in the last session, you would have heard about the case of Jane Wenham, who was the last woman who um, stood trial for witchcraft. And in her records... They called her a witch and a bitch. And I think it's that link to that word as well. I just wonder what you think about that as a slur. Well, I think, yeah, the link to the animal. Um, and in the, the last session, which I found really interesting, there was a lot of talk about the, the imp or the familiar. And I think um, there was a lot of connection of women and animals. Um, women have always been seen as being closer to animals than men, you know, if mm. we're seeing the world in, in binary terms like that. Um, and also the belief at the time, it, we're talking the Middle Ages, which obviously is a very long period, but um, there was a belief that women were more susceptible to demon possession because they were more porous. Like they literally had more holes, more holes in. in their body <laughs> through which a demon could enter. This is real. I'm not making this up. This is a real thing. Um, but the, also they were just very leaky, always periods, breast milk, crying, just women were just kind of leaky all the time, things going in and out, demons can slip in. Um, so there was definitely this belief that, yeah, women had a sort of looser boundary between them and the natural world. Um, so yeah, to call a bitch, a, a woman a bitch, a dog, um, I think, I find this actually use of bitch and dog really interesting because to call a man a dog is not an insult it's not necessarily a compliment but it's not really an insult to say that a man is a dog whereas to say a woman is either a dog or a bitch they have different meanings but that's not a compliment I don't see I kind of see people reclaiming bitch I don't really see people reclaiming dog uh, maybe that's going to come next with a lot so many so many insults that men get are kind of like masculinized versions of female slurs. So they get like, you're a boy bitch, you're a man whore, mm -hmm. you're a man slut. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really interesting that that's because there aren't really any slurs for men. Except fuck boy. Fuck boy. Yeah. <laughs> that would <one, that> <laughs> just for them. Actually, no. I mean, at least I've never had a fuck girl. Exactly. Oh gosh, she's such a fuck girl. Yeah, let's let's, yeah. let's claim it now. Never thought I'd say fuck boy in the British Library. Oh, oh my God. God. We've, we've, Apologize. We have sworn quite a lot, so sorry. 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 Oh well. Um, let's get back to the let's get to the writing process here. So, I I, I just want to think about the 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 process of putting words down on a page with the intention of conjuring images, thoughts, feelings in other people. That's witchcraft in itself, right? Mm. Um, talk to me about, 
let's start with you, Stacey. Talk yeah. to me about your the process of writing. Like, how did you put the, that book together? How did you decide that that was the story that you wanted to write? Oh God, if I'm going to be really honest, like I found the whole process painful. Like <laughs> it's like I procrastinated so much with research because I find like with the opening, like it's kind of like a song, like it sets the rhythm. But then it's kind of like it's trying to find that first line. So it's like, I don't know about you guys, but it's like I end up putting so much pressure on myself. And it's kind of like it was only when I told myself to relax and just try to kind of envision the story from the words of my main character that I kind of like kind of found the rhythm. And it's it wasn't that it was plain sailing after that. But like once I had my character's voice, it's kind of like I was able to really kind of get along with those first few chapters. But I feel like with writing, it's kind of trial by error a lot of the times because there's so many kind of missteps and even when I look back on my first draft I kind of went and I'm kind of like oh my god I must have been pranked because like why would I write this bit and then you just realize that's what the edits are for but yeah it is just like it's it can just be like such a hard task all the time as well but like when it works like it works and like those are the bits that feel like magic but I don't know, I always feel like, oh, God, why doesn't it feel like more kind of effortless? And you just realise, yeah, it's like spells. They take a lot of, like, work to, like, come off properly. <laughs> I like that. It's like oh. spells. Yeah. yeah. So Amy, how, how, about, how about you? Um, because your book's rooted in mm. real history and you actually use real historical figures as well. Mm. So that must have been a challenge in itself. Yeah. So um, it helped that I know Manning Tree, the town, very well. Um, my dad lives there and um, there are kind of lots of historical documents um, that correspond directly. We have um, Rebecca West, my protagonist, uh, we have her confession um, and uh, the Witchfinder General Matthew Hopkins wrote his own book about hunting witches. Um, he got a, a book deal out of it. Nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, released the year he died though. Um, of suspected tuberculosis at the age of 27, so... Ha -ha. Sucks to be. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it was... And it was the contemporary accounts of um, events in Manning Tree uh, that first kind of drew me into the story because they're wonderful... Doc they sort of read like... Um, these mini Angela Carter short stories, kind of the richness of the language, and the sort of... Um, you know, you've got people tearing the heads off shadow bunnies and people's clothes bubbling up with lice and um, just the most brilliant and vaudevillian and, and horrible stuff. Um, and I wanted, I knew I wanted to stick as closely as possible to the facts as, as they have come to us of, of what went on in Manning Tree and Mistley because I found it very strange that um, very often when people were writing about um, witch trials that really happened, they tended to often ignore the, the actual historical victims in favor of, or they would gravitate towards who was the most middle or upper middle class. But like, if there was a noble woman they could latch onto, they would write about her. It, it, and it, it struck me as very strange, or they would make up a noble woman to write about rather than, and, and the actual historical women would kind of be a, a sideshow to know, the personal life of this noble woman or whatever. And I found that very strange. And I wondered if it was kind of a, a failure to be able to project empathy onto ostensibly peasant women. Um, so I knew I wanted to stay as close to Rebecca and, and Anne, um, whose dynamic uh, I, I found fascinating as, as possible. Um, but I mean, I loved writing this book. I, yeah, I have so much fun when I'm writing. <laughs> um, and I read the King James Bible a lot. I, 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 Cause I was trying to kind of get myself into a Puritan frame of mind um, and, and kind of the, the sort of sulfur and hellfire of um, a Calvinist <laughs> worldview, which, um, cause I, you know, in, in depicting the Witchfinder General, I didn't want him to be flat. I wanted him to be I, I also wanted to um, think about the deleterious emotional and psychological effects that a Puritan worldview might have had upon a man as well. Mm. Um, I didn't want him to be this kind of pervy old Svengali like he is in the Vincent Price version or he, he is often depicted, um, but as a kind of the brittle, insecure, um, 
pious uh, figure. He, he, it felt like he came through as to me in, in reading his own writing. He had a, a, his ob sort of obsession with witches, while I wouldn't go so far as to say it was sexual when you re read his own writing, certainly has a, an almost erotic element to it, his own writing about witches. Um, and I just found that very fascinating, yeah. <laughs> no, I, think, I think it's really interesting and I, I, I researched that period as well and mm. I think I have a lot of appreciation for the fact that you were reading the King James Bible. Um, <laughs> <laughs> again and again yeah. and again, yeah. Do you know, with your books, you have a whole world that you've created. It's rooted in the real world, but it's also not the real world at all. How do you approach that? Do you, is it the world building first and the characters or what was the process for you? Um, so I, I started, pro so I came up with the idea in 2018 while I was touring one of my YA books, but I actually started writing it during lockdown and I really thought we were going to die. I wasn't a very happy camper, it has to be said. I really did think it was like the monkey virus from Outbreak. And so I sort of thought, right, well, I'm going to plan everything really, really carefully. So actually, more than anything else, I really did know what was going to happen in all three books. And every little, I know a lot has been made of the cliffhangers. They were always planned. You know, it was it's <laughs> one story in three parts. It was never, it was always going to be three. And, and so what that's left me with now is, is the horrible thing where, you know, I've been writing it for three years and now I have to do it. Mm. which is quite difficult. So at the beginning, it felt like magic. So the, yeah. the first book, as it was like, yeah, sure, why not? Why not? There are four kinds of witches. Why not? And it was all those kind of, yeah, we can do this, and it's all the rules and making up the rules. Now in book three, I've actually got to land the plane, and that's much harder. Mm. Um, so it has been like, it was like book one, magic. Book two, slightly less magic. Book three, it's like being in a torture device. It's like I'm on a rack. Oh. Um, I'm, determined, <laughs> I'm determined to finish it by Christmas. But um, all those rules I made in 2020, now I've got to stick to them. Yeah, because yeah, we're all waiting. We're all waiting. I know. Well, there's going to be... So next year I'm doing my historical bits. So next year we're doing the novella the, about Anne Boleyn. So it's the first... The first coven... It's, so it's yes, which is really nice, actually, because that felt, that felt gleeful. That got some of the old magic back mm. because to be able to go to Hampton Court and the Palace of Placentia and and play with Anne has been really fun. Get, historical fiction is fucking hard, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> don't expect another one. Um, but, um, but no, it, it's been, yeah, it was certainly, but, but first and foremost, it was, it was about the characters. And, and I said, you know, back in that hotel room in Melbourne, it was desperate housewives, but they're witches. And, and it was only later that I thought, but what if there was a trans witch? And then all of a sudden it became something very different and much more, pert much more pertinent to my life. And, you know, it became something... I, I guess a little more interesting, maybe, um, as in a, in a way for you know going back to what I previously said about what is it you need witches to be, mm. you know I needed it to be a space for me to think about feminism, and and that's you know what the books were. But in terms of the world building, that was just fun. That was just <laughs> and very much as it as I came to it, you know. And I'm still doing that even in book three. I'm like. <laughs> like that thing you said in book one what if, what if we could use that so. oh I love that I love that and um, Kirsty with, with your book your, your book is very much it, it slips into different time periods and you have different parts of your character's life at, at different moments it's not entirely linear I guess that's what I was trying to say how did you craft that I mean that's a, I, I can't imagine how somebody would be able to put something together in that kind of way so yeah, I guess it's actually not as complicated as, uh, well, hopefully it seems more complicated than it was in my head. Um, I hate writing, actually. Um, <laughs> working on my 10th book, hate writing. Um, <laughs> I love... Club. <laughs> <laughs> Some say I could do something else, but I can't. Um, <laughs> I love planning writing. I love researching. I love thinking about writing. I love staring out of the window and having a coffee and daydreaming. Um, and I love editing and... I especially love cutting bits out. I cut like 15,000 words out of this book when we were almost on the final edit. It was much longer and I just ripped it out. It felt brilliant. I don't like the actual like putting the words on the page part. That to me feels like trudging through very soft sand. <laughs> it's just, I don't enjoy it at all. It's part of the process. Um, 
but I don't enjoy it. Um, and the thing that I was trying to do with the time, I'm not sure I was entirely successful, but this is what I was you were, trying to you do. You were, you were. Okay, well, here's what's well. I'll tell you what I was trying to do, and you can tell me if I managed it. So the book's in five parts. Um, one, three, and five are fairly straightforward, standard, chronological order. We're just following Lux and Else on their journey. Two and four are when it gets a little bit strange um, because those are their stories, um, Lux's and Elsa's stories in their own words. And they look different on the page. And Lux's section, um, because she can't read or write, I thought she would have some kind of creative spelling. Um, so there's no punctuation, really. It's all these kind of run-on sentences. Um, she's quite breathless as well because nobody's ever really listened to her before. So she's telling this story and she gets very excited. And um, it's also told non-chronologically, um, just in that one little section. And th what I was trying to do with that is I had been reading a really interesting book that was talking about conceptions of time and specifically queering of time um, in the Middle Ages, how time was not maybe as clear cut as we would think of it now. So um, many people didn't really know exactly how old they were. They would know kind of roughly how old they were, but they didn't have a birth certificate. Um, they didn't maybe necessarily know exactly what year they were born. People's names were very porous as well. So um, quite often you wouldn't go far from where you were born. So you didn't really have a surname if you didn't need a surname because you were the only not that there would have been a Kirsty, but you were the only Kirsty in the village, so you didn't need a surname because there was no need to differentiate between all the different Kirsties because there was only one. Um, and people didn't have clocks, they didn't have watches. If you lived in a city, then there would be a somebody ringing a bell on the hour to tell you what the time was. But if you live out in the woods, you don't know what time it is. There's no need to be somewhere at a specific time. And I was very interested to learn um, that in certain periods in the Middle Ages, an hour actually changed length. So a day was from when the sun came up to when the sun went down. So, and a day was always 12 hours. So obviously in the summer, 12 hours was a lot longer. And or each individual hour became a lot longer than in the winter, each individual, because it was still 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of night, but they would expand and contract. And I found that really, really interesting. So in Lux's section, um, where she's at the sanctuary, time gets a bit funny and she doesn't know what time it is and she she only knows what time it is based on the seasons and based on when she gets called to prayer so that's the only way that she knows what the time is um, so I wanted to play around with time and then in Elsa's section by the way you can read this and not be aware of any of this this was just me as the writer <laughs> messing around in Elsa's section it's structured like a song um, I was thinking of like an old murder ballad so it's structured like a ballad so she's talking about this one moment of, of trauma that she's had, which kind of forms the chorus. So her kind of narrative is these kind of longer um, verse sections. And then the, the chorus, which she keeps returning to this same moment over and over and over and over. And it's written in this very kind of repetitive little chunk. And it was meant to be like the chorus. So you do this stuff to entertain yourself, or I do this stuff to entertain myself, because um, writing's hard. Yeah. Well, we, <laughs> so you can, play games <laughs> we all benefit from this. So thank you for putting yourself through torture so that we can read your books. Um, I'm going to open out to audience questions now. Um, so if you've been, oh, we have a question already there. And I'm sorry, the light's in my face. So if I miss anyone over this way, I'm not doing it on purpose, but I'll keep blinding myself to try and see. Thank you. Hey. Um, you, you kind of touched on earlier, Amy, about the, the cyclical trends in publishing and all of that sort of thing. Uh, we're currently clearly in this quote-unquote witch-lit trend. And so I'm just wondering how you individually feel about that term um, because it feels a little bit derogatory, a little bit like chick-lit was. Mm. Um, or maybe you're reclaiming it and making it, you know, something amazing. So I'm just wondering what you feel about that term. Mm. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I find it... I mean, obviously, you know, it's descriptive in the same way like uh, war novels, for instance, is. Um, I, yeah, I, I suppose I, I do find it a bit like siloing. I mean, I don't, I don't even necessarily like when a novel is sort of the idea of like feminist novels. <laughs> like here's a table of feminist novels. Oh, that um, table in Waterstones is that, my yeah, favourite. Yeah, femme girl, <laughs> lady novels. <laughs> um, Nowhere else in the shop, just that yeah. one table. <laughs> um, since, like, you know, I 
feminism is is not it's not just when lady does thing um <laughs> so uh yeah I, I i would never sort of identify myself as an author of witch lit um imagine <laughs> yeah. i don't um, think any author would no, no no it's a marketing conceit i suppose i think of it more that way um and you know i i have as little to do with it as i have with most other marketing conceits yeah, yeah. <laughs> i just literally never think about it um, no no. I have no opinion because I just never ever think about it. Um, yeah, because um, it's not as bad as literature. Oh, oh that's yeah. bad. Yeah. yeah. Was that? That's not a thing. That is yeah. that's, yeah. I've heard. Yeah. 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 Witch, oh, witch, yeah. Witcher? Witch, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> you get a lot of labels put on you, mm. both as a writer and as a person. Um, so you know, I get asked would you like, or not even would you, you don't get asked. My, sometimes my book is in the Scottish section. Sometimes it is in the LGBT section. Is it ever on the feminism table? It's, it's on the feminism <laughs> table. Sometimes it's on the mythology and fairy tale table. Mm. And like, it's fine. Or, you know, even, you know, I get put forward for a lot of LGBTQ stuff or what's your opinion on LGBTQ thing? And I'm like, well, number one, I'm not LGBT and Q. Mm -hmm. Nobody is mm -hmm. all of them. I'm not even sure which one or ones I am, to be honest. So people will say, are you a lesbian? And I go, sure. And they go, are you bisexual? And I go, sure. And they go, are you queer? And I go, sure. Because I don't know. I'm just living my life you know you don't mm. have your lesbian coffee and have your witch lit coffee in the morning you just <laughs> you're just living your life um i'm just writing my books at no point did i sit down and think i'm going to do a witch book i just you just write your books and then um or you just live your life and then later somebody whacks a label on it and fine Mm. It does my sense is it could be worse <laughs> um <laughs> i mean i think i've probably been on work like i've been in the like 50 percent off table is the worst table <laughs> like, but, um, <laughs> You're there in, yeah. in book work. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But, but I, think, I guess if I did have a problem with witch lit literature, is that it's not especially helpful to you, the reader. Mm, yeah. You know, because you know, just the four of us, our books are so yeah. different. You know, and that that's so the fact that our books happen to have a, a vaguely witchy lady in, it's not it's not particularly useful to you. Mm. And I, and I think possibly, I, I don't think particularly even in the industry knows what it wants to do with it, if I'm honest. Mm. Um, but no, I, I would rather that than the feminist table, because that fucking feminist table really boils my piss. <laughs> I'll tell you, you never... No, 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 here we go. You, never, you will never see Marion Keys on that table. One of the most, I think, important female voices mm. of the last 25 years, and Marion Keys is not on that table, and that is because there's a little cartoon woman on the front of her books. Mm. You know, it doesn't look right. You know, you're not going to... Oh, oh, there we go. Sorry, that's a different panel. A different <laughs> panel for a different time. But here, here, though, to Marion Keys. Woo! Um, <laughs> Stacey. Yeah, like, I do think with the term, like, it can... Like, I get that it's, like, a marketing term, but then it also feels quite patronising as well because, you know, as, like, everyone said, like, all our books are quite different. So if I'm a reader and, and something's described as witch lit, it's like, OK, so it's going to have witches in it. And then you're kind of like, and like, what else is there? And I guess like, as a writer, like I get with kind of chick lit writers, though that's just really patronizing as well. But it's like, I guess, you know, with, you can kind of see what their stories are, but then it's like, I don't see myself as a witch lit author forever. So mm. if I, when I do write other books, it's kind of like, okay, Stacey Thomas, author of one witch lit book. And then other genres it's kind of like I think as a writer you do feel boxed in but then I also feel like it's probably like one of the kind of hazards of being published in that they want to kind of box you in and kind of like kind of identify your brand even if you've just written like one book and it's sort of like but what brand because it's like I'm still figuring that out with my stories in a way. Mm. I'm, I'm very, very conscious of time, but I'm also oh, yeah. aware that we've not had two... Well, we've had one question, <laughs> <laughs> let's be honest. So um, if, we, if I can ask you to give short-ish oh, answers mm, to okay. the next one few. Quick fire. We'll go to one sentence. Sentence. Quick fire, yeah, yeah, that's it. Quick fire questions. Quick fire so if we go to this person here. Uh, yeah, there's been quite a bit of talk about kind of family relationships as well today. And, you know, I really loved how you wrote about um, your family, especially Holly and Elle and Annie and kind of intergenerational relationships. And I guess my question is for all of you within kind of fictional witch 
novels, what do you think the significance of kind of the maternal figure, figure is within um, the characters of witches? Ooh, good question. Do you know, I didn't realise I was writing a book about motherhood until really late in the day. But yes, the whole trilogy, and as, as the way Neve becomes Theo's sister slash mother, whichever way you want to see it. Um, and yeah, and, and you know, I come from very much matriarchy, so how, how could I not have that influence my writing? Um, but it kind of figures, because the other big thing, I mean, some people have said my book is horror, um, generational trauma. I mean, what, what is more 2023 than the sheer notion of generational trauma? Every horror film is about generational trauma. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, um, short answers, yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, obviously, sort of uh, the, the witch as a figure is often connected to this idea of kind of um, female knowledge and intergenerational female knowledge and how that's been uh, shared and transmitted, kind of passing from mothers to daughters um, and how that knowledge can sometimes come hand in hand with trauma. 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 Generational trauma. Gener trauma. Generational <laughs> trauma. trauma. I mean, yeah. My, my novel's also about uh, a mother and a daughter and their relationship was very significant and powerful to me. Um, partly because of um, stuff I have going on with my own <laughs> uh, maternal relationships, but also because um, Rebecca West um, accused her own um, mother of witchcraft and, and a lot of historians believe that probably she was only spared the noose basically because she did that. Um, and I really wanted to dig into sort of the, the psychology of, of that relationship. Um, yeah, uh, not really sort of, yeah, those are my thoughts. <laughs> I have a very short answer, which is that it, it, I don't think it's a coincidence that I've had two books out this year. Mm. One is a novel, Now She Is Witch, and one is a memoir called The Unfamiliar, which is a memoir of queer parenthood, queer motherhood. Um, they might seem very different, but they're not that different. Mm. And with my one, like, motherhood is, like, quite central because one of my characters, you know, he's a witch, but, like, his mother died in childbirth, so it's kind of, like he's kind of cut off from that part of like his like heritage. So that's kind of what drives like part of his character. And then with um, another character, she loses her child. So it's all about her trying to figure out like, can she be a mother without having a child as well? And that kind of drives a lot of um, the kind of gritty parts of the story. Um, we, we'll squeeze, sorry, British Library. We'll squeeze one last question, but really short answers. And I okay. noticed that somebody has their hand up there. Um, this might be a bit random, but like, um, how do you envision like how the witch is fashioned? Like, how do you envision when you're writing your characters how their fashion is? Is it like sort of stereotypical witch, or would you say it's more like modern day? <laughs> um, I mean, I was writing about uh, 17th century Puritans, so there's very much a quite defined look. You couldn't get away with much. <laughs> Um, in Puritan Manning Tree in 1643, like unfortunately. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, which I mean, and obviously the way the way we visualise witches now, a lot of a lot of kind of the aspects of the costuming are basically 17th century uh, British peasant fashion. Um, so yeah, I, I didn't get to do much exciting stuff with clothes in my novel, um, but it's a strong look. The little the little white bonnet and um, yeah. the little well, bustle. Well, no, yeah. I mean, mine was an ode to the Spice Girls, so it was it really, which was the other big thing I wanted to write my big Spice Girl novel. Um, and so, yeah, so it, there was, it was always, I always had that reference to go back to. And what a way to spend lockdown, just mm. watching mm. hours and hours of interviews with the Spice Girls. Victoria Beckham is hilarious. <laughs> no, really, I, like, I feel like the rest of the world is waking up to that Do you remember that Vogue video she did where they were like, what's your favorite flavor? And she just goes, salt. <laughs> but what's your favourite game? The Hunger Game. She gets it. She completely gets it. She knows. She knows. Yeah. Well, I had a rule for myself when I decided to write a, a Middle Ages novel, which was no jousting, mm. no forsooth, and no pointy hat. <laughs> um, because I wanted it to feel very real. So I actually have very little description of clothing in the book, and it's mostly 
quite generic terms like she put her dress on, she put her shoes on. Because I thought as soon as I describe a pointy hat with a veil on or as soon as I describe a wimple, um, the reader's going to get pulled out of the story because they're going to be like, I don't know what a wimple is. I've never worn a wimple. I don't know what that feels like. I've never worn a wimple, so what would I know about I've it? I've never worn a wimple. I, I should, really. <laughs> I should. I've worn a wimple. I'm really... <laughs> so, but really as soon as you out. said the pointy hat with the veil, I thought of Maid Marian as a fox. Yeah, yeah. But that would have also been <laughs> trouble. Yeah. My childhood crush, yeah. yeah. Um, and Robin Hood as well, confusing yeah. times. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I actually tried to keep the clothing extremely generic so that it would feel very real to mm. the reader. Yeah. I had a lot of fun with the fashion just because in my book, the characters, like the witches who have powers, it's all Fred magic. So it's kind of like using kind of Fred and knots to like cast spells. So it was kind of like when I'm describing the really luxurious outfits that some of my characters are wearing, so like the ribbons and the bodices. So I had a lot of fun looking at kind of um, like costume designs in those periods as well. Yeah, so fashion was really important. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. And we've only gone five minutes over. It's almost six, but we'll... we'll <laughs> oh, no, it's going to be six. Mm -hmm. um, Stacey, Kirsty, Juno, Amy, thank you so much for that. And thank, thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you.